Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm a little bit nervous to speak uh, the first, but thank you, um, Suzanne, for inviting me. I'm, I'm very honored to share with you some of my experience. Um, I'm going to talk about the um, renovation of the Hong Kong Museum of Art today because um, we're closing for three years for a major renovation. Uh, but then I've uh, tried to make up this title for my presentation, which is Designing the Future. I hope you can all see, do you see the future? I deliberately put it in yellow because just so as to reflect the fact that it's hard to see the future. Um, so when talking about the renovation, I'm sure you will agree that we're not just talking about the design of the museum, the design of the building, but we are actually not designing for the future but designing the future, what our museum wants to propose um, to be the future. Uh, and in this case, it would be the future of Hong Kong. Uh, it is always my belief that a museum has a close relationship with the place where it finds itself. So the city of Hong Kong is where our museum relates to in the first place. Uh, just now, Suzanne has talked about uh, sometimes we built the museum, we designed it as a landmark of the city, uh, a shiny icon, and we always want to use the museum to brand the city. So in this way, in any case, what we choose for, whether it's a human scale space or it's a shiny icon, uh, we are thinking that we want to shape the place, the city. And so shaping the future museum is in fact shaping directly the future of the city. That's my thinking. But who can tell what's the future? It's hard to know the unknown because it's not there yet. So here I'm just trying to share with you my thinking process in planning for this renovation. Uh, it may be bits and pieces. I tried to put it together in a more sensible way that I hope it would make sense to you. And uh, mind you that it's the first time I do this presentation, pulling up all the, all the bits and pieces. So I'm, I'm really um, grateful if you can give me your genuine feedback after hearing my proposal. My proposal is, um, for my thinking process, it's a two-way process. Um, it's historical thinking, which means knowing the past, and also creative thinking, which is imagining the future. I think a lot of people put the emphasis on thinking about the future, the creative part, but not so much has been done to look at the past. I think historical thinking is important because we do not exist in a vacuum. Every museum, everyone exists somewhere in time for some reasons. This is especially true for the Hong Kong Museum of Art because we are already 53 years old. So we have a very long standing history. I think it's important to know our past. So in this process, when I first started, we were trying to work with all the colleagues in search of the Hong Kong MA DNA. We brainstorm, we have different ideation sections. We asked ourselves who we used to be, who we are right now, and who we want to be. We come up with a long list of strengths and weaknesses. I'm going to share with you just two of them, the key one. I would say one of our first strengths is that, uh, as I said, we have a very long standing history. Uh, there's no other, I would say, uh, well, very few cultural institution in Hong Kong that would have that long history in Hong Kong. So in fact, our legacy is also Hong Kong's legacy. And also the history of Hong Kong MA, how it evolves, actually ties closely to the history of Hong Kong. And I would say the Hong Kong MA DNA is very much the cultural DNA of Hong Kong. Before talking about the future, let's go back to the past. Well, back in 1869, this is not the museum, but this is the first museum in Hong Kong. Um, the first museum was situated in uh, an old city hall. There, are, there were just two rooms, maybe, for the display of um, objects. It was dis demolished between the 1930s and 40s uh, before the war. 
This is uh, a picture, a very rare picture, showing the inside of the museum, the so-called museum. And I would say, uh, in terms of a museum, it's a colonial museum set up by the British in the Victoria city where the foreigners used to go, but not the Chinese. And it's a museum where they put in this barren land, and that's the British uh, thinking about Hong Kong at that time. In terms of a museum display, is more, oh, sorry. It's very much the old kind of uh, museum setting. It's like a cabinet of curios, and from the very little um, documents that we found in uh, talking about this museum is that it has all sorts of exotic items from around the world, like peacocks or peacocks from Australia or, or lion heads from uh, the New Territories. Um, so in fact, it's uh, things that the British colonizer found in everywhere around the world where uh, the land that he has, uh, they have conquered. So it's very much telling the story of the conqueror. It's not a local story. It's nothing about the place itself. And art, I would say, is almost non-existent at that time. Then comes to our birth in 1962. Um, this is the new city hall, and we were on the top three floors of the of the building, and in fact, there's the low block, this is the high block. It was conceived as a complex. So we have performance venue, we have library, and we have the museum uh, on the top of the building. Now that uh, we have dedicated space for art exhibition, we can have lots of different kinds of exhibition. And at that time, our first um, chief curator, Lawrence Tam, he coined the museum as the floating museum because it's on the top three floors of the building. So it's a floating museum, very poetic. And uh, the museum was first called the City Museum and Art Gallery, uh, because we are a combination of a uh, museum at that time was um, mainly refers to the historical artifacts uh, that we collected, and also the art gallery, the fine art part. And from the name, you know that the conception of the museum has already the thinking of tying up the museum with the city, representing the city. So we, are, we were two in one museum, but then in 1975, we separated, so uh, that becomes the Hong Kong Museum of History, and then we become the Hong Kong Museum of Art. And you can see the specialization uh, of art. Uh, uh, this is a very modernist thinking, I would say, to separate uh, different categories or uh, disciplines in order to specialize for development and for study. And um, as you can see from the setting, it's very much a white cube kind of display. And so art is very much still floating in the air, um, pretty much uh, disconnected with people and the city, although we do have a lot of um, local art exhibitions at that time. And you would, uh, I would say that at that time, it's not just telling the story of this modern city, but also, uh, in fact, in the 1960s, uh, it was um, the starting point of the modern art development in Hong Kong as well. And then there comes the relocation in 1991. And with this relocation, we have um, seven times more exhibition space, uh, and it makes it possible for us to dedicate permanent gallery for our collection display. And this is a purpose-built museum. Uh, you have to go one more, one floor uh, up to enter into the museum. It's pretty much like a very enclosed box. And this is the space inside. You can see that it's almost like a temple. You have to go up the grand staircase, purify yourself, and then to worship the fine art. And it's also a grand showcase because with um, this um, uh, extensive space, we bring in a lot of blockbusters exhibitions and we have a lot of spectacular installations. Um, so it's more or less like uh, a spectacle for people. And we're telling, since we are pulling exhibitions from around the world, from Palace Museum from Beijing or from British Museum in Britain, so we're telling an international story which is pretty much the identity of the city as well, a cosmopolitan city. But, the, um, all right. And then comes the second strength. We are a composite museum. 
meaning that we have a wide range of collections. Uh, we are very diverse by nature. From, we have collections from the contemporary to the ancient, from traditional to modern. We have a lot of important donations from local collectors. And most importantly, we have a very important but very uh, unknown collection on historical pictures. And I would say uh, our collection is uh, among the top five in the world. But all these are uh, stories untold. You can see our gallery. We have um, galleries for uh, each one of our collection, Chinese antiquities, Sri Bai Jai, which is a very important um, donation of Chinese painting and calligraphy, historical pictures gallery, Chinese fine art gallery. And we have two special exhibitions gallery where we bring in um, blockbusters exhibition from around the world. Sometimes it's modern, sometimes it's more um, traditional. So everything is great. The only thing is that the exhibitions and the collections, they're not talking to each other. So visitors are like going into each one of the gallery, coming out, seeing an Andy Warhol just next to a very traditional Chinese painting exhibition without relating the exhibitions to each other and with, without making sense of the total experience of the museum. And what is more, all these masterpieces and all these treasures, they have little relationship to the common people. And last but not least, we have no, if you uh, have noted this, we have no dedicated gallery for Hong Kong art. So whenever tourists or tr students want to come to the museum to see Hong Kong art, they may not be able to see any. Sometimes they can. So when thinking about the future, we have to rethink ourselves uh, in the current situation. Uh, being one of the government museum, uh, we, we have uh, the Leisure and Cultural Services Department in Hong Kong, which has 14 museums, and our museum is one of them. So we are always very mindful of what our sister museums or offices are doing, how we are not um, overlapping each other, duplicating resources, and how we can position ourselves the best. These are uh, museums that have um, established since uh, the opening of the Hong Kong Museum of Art. I have uh, quoted some major ones. The Hong Kong Heritage Museum in Sha Tin, which is, very, which is a very big museum. Oh, missed one. Uh, I should have um, the old, um, the old, the, the new old art space, uh, which is a small art space, but um, a very uh, vibrant one. And it's uh, not the museum, but it's doing a lot of very interesting um, art activities. And then uh, for private endeavors, we have the Asia Society. Oh, this is the oil. We have the PMQ, the police marriage quarters. Uh, we have the central police station coming up next year, which is a whole complex um, renovated from a historical uh, compound. And then we have the gigantic West Kowloon Cultural District with 15 uh, performing arts venues and a very big museum and plus. Other than these, we have a lot of independent art spaces in Hong Kong. So I would say the, cult the cultural and art ecology is completely different from when we first started in, 1960, in the 1960s and also when we relocated to Chim Sa Choi in 1990s. So how can we imagine our future? I would say, to, now that we have found our DNA, the question is how we are going to do this genetic engineering. But I'm not saying that we are going to turn from a man to a woman. The challenge is how can we be different but not losing ourselves, losing who we are or who we used to be. And I think it's important to define our core business and I've uh, break it up into, as our name represented, I've break it up into three parts. Uh, usually we define the museum, oh sorry, the museum, the museum, the art. I think all these need to be redefined as the concept, the ideas um, uh, in the 21st century. But also, we also need to define what is Hong Kong, what we want to do for Hong Kong in the 21st century. 
We're talking about a renovation and extension project. We're not rebuilding the museum. We are not demolishing the museum and rebuilt from scratch. We do not have that budget, and we do not want to do that. Um, the first thing is, we, we are real, uh, this is the museum. We are located in a, a cultural complex. This is the performing arts uh, venue, and uh, this is our sister museum, the Space Museum, in front of us. Uh, we have a Salisbury Garden, but uh, it was not very uh, 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 fully used, utilized before. So, as you can see, we, we, we were somehow blocked by uh, the Space Museum from this main row of, the, uh, of Hong Kong, the Nathan Row, and then we are more or less of the same color as the cultural center, which makes it very invisible. And then at the back, in fact, this is the Avenue of Star, where thousands and thousands of uh, tourists would come by every day and passing by us without knowing who we are because we are so enclosed and people can't see through us. So we want to improve the visibility and also our connection with the surroundings. And most of all, uh, you can see that people still have to go up uh, one floor to go into the museum, which is not very accessible. That's the only entrance that we have. Um, so we really want to, with all these um, brick walls, people can't see through us and we cannot see the city. And inside, we have very low ceiling height. We have a very limited gallery spaces uh, that makes uh, program uh, uh, very limited. And also, we cannot have a, a Hong Kong art display for, uh, in a long-term uh, basis. So that's what we are proposing uh, for the change of the building. The transformation is we are lowering our entrance to the ground floor. And we are also increasing the number of entrances on this side and this side, so that make it easier for people to come. We're building one more floor on top of the museum, which is a brand new gallery. And we are also um, doing an extension, an annex building, which, is, uh, which will provide uh, additional space uh, for exhibition as well. And then this is the back of the museum facing the harbor. Uh, we are relocating our cafe and shop on this side. The cafe and the restaurant will be uh, along this corridor and here facing the harbor, enjoying the harbor view, maximizing the harbor view. And then we are also um, adding one more entrance at the back. We're opening up the windows to en for people to enjoy the harbor and also people can come out of the museum to uh, see the harbor and the city on the top. So now that we have the entrance on the ground floor, I would say we are a truly grounded museum, one that connects well with the city. We are also changing the tiles. Uh, well, people dislike our tiles for many years, but we cannot just um, take away the tiles, but then we are dressing it up, uh, put the clothes on it. So these are modular systems that we are going to put uh, on top of the exterior so, so that we can change the feel of it and also the color of it uh, to make ourselves different from uh, the cultural center. And here we will have a nine meter high space uh, where we can accommodate larger exhibits. So this is the future entrance of the museum. Uh, this is the nine meter high NS building. Uh, you can see different levels of spaces. So that would make it more interesting uh, that the museum can have a mixture of galleries with different kinds of space for different programs. This is the top floor gallery. This is how we looked like now. And this is what we will become. I hope you find it very different. And this is from another angle. Uh, this is uh, now the podium where we have the three, uh, we used to have the three public sculptures on top, but no one is looking at them. And then we are turning it into an annex building. That's it. So just a very quick comparison. After the renovation, we'll have a 42% increase of exhibition space. We'll have higher galleries, uh, galleries of different heights. And most important of all, we'll be able to dedicate a permanent gallery for the display of Hong Kong art. 
So we are maximizing our use of our harbor, which is of prime location. We are increasing our transparency and interaction with the city. Uh, we are having a diversified programming. We can use the indoor and outdoor uh, with the cafe and also the bookshop. It will be a good place for meeting people and encounter. And also, if we can creatively use the space inside and outside, making use of this transparent entrance and uh, walls of the museum, I'm sure we can attract people who do not intend to go to the museum in Chim Sao Choi, but just going to the shopping malls, they would be interested to come in. And we'll make better use of the space in front of us uh, so that it would serve as the extended arm of the museum, inviting people into the museum. We are doing some um, art displays uh, throughout these years, and in future, with the inside uh, galleries, we can do echoing exhibitions. Well, in fact, before we close, we presented a sculptor, a sculptor, a very famous Taiwanese sculptor, Zhu Ming, exhibition uh, in the museum, and we put some of his outdoor sculptures uh, outside, and people were really excited seeing the sculptures, and then they know about this exhibition inside the museum. It's much better than just having a banner there because they can have a direct feel of the exhibits. So about the curatorial and program, how are we going to um, transform? And my thinking is that, uh, first of all, When what we have, uh, as I've just said, the strength is our collection, which is very diverse, and we need to rethink about the relationship between the collections and the different exhibitions. In terms of time periods, I would propose we do not look at time in a linear way, but in fact they are parallel times existing together. And in fact, when we are saying that we want to shape the future, in fact, we are also shaping the past and shaping the present. So each of these, in fact, they are shaping each other as well. So our understanding of time, sorry, of time and space should be different. And then in terms of the diverse genres, media, cultures, and stories that were presented in the collection and in exhibitions, could we can see them can see, could we see them as not separate worlds, but coexisting parallel worlds? Um, and just as uh, the, this, this uh, diagram, the two diagrams together, in the past we are presenting exhibitions in one gallery, another gallery, and then perhaps another gallery. But in future, while maybe we're still doing similar things, but I think it's always the overlap, overlapping areas that is most interesting. So maybe when we present exhibitions, we can think of how we can do echo exhibitions, how we can pull things from the collection to echo, to complement the exhibition, and maybe we can also develop exhibitions that focus on talking about these overlapping areas. So it's really how to pull the threads through all these different zones and how to identify their linkages and establish connection that will be uh, what we have to think about in future. So I would propose uh, what we want to be in future is we continue to be a storyteller, but this time we are telling a unique story of Hong Kong and Hong Kong art. And in presenting overseas exhibitions, we'll be presenting in the language of Hong Kong and looking at the traditions and art of the other parts of the world from the perspective of Hong Kong. So very much the future Hong Kong MA I would propose would be the identity of the museum would represent also the identity of the city. And in this way, we are in fact locally telling a global story as Hong Kong used to be. I've said that we are now a grounded museum, we'll be Hong Kong focused, but when we say Hong Kong focus, we do not just focus on Hong Kong artists. In fact, there are a lot of other 
players in the art field, like collectors, like other stakeholders, art organizations, curators, sketch curators, independent curators, or independent art space. So we want to have more collaborations, uh, and we want to relate to all these people in building up the museum. And our belief uh, is that returning to the local, returning to Hong Kong is important when everyone wants to go global, to connect with the global. Why it is important? Because it's my belief that Hong Kong will remain a cultural desert, as people uh, have called us for many years, a cultural desert, if we do not nurture our own unique artistic talents and artistic tradition. And what is more, the local, I would say for every city in the world, the local is what defines the city and what differentiates them from the other global cities. So it is what makes it irreplaceable. And if we want to continue to be unique and irreplaceable, I think the local is where we have to uh, put more focus on. I'm mindful of the time. It's OK. I'm coming to the end. So in future, I would say, Hong Kong MA will be a kaleidoscope where we connect objects, different objects, ideas, cultures, and stories. And the kaleidoscope is something that you have to interact in order you see, you mix and match to see a different picture. So audience do not just come into the museum and look at what we put up there for them. They have to do something to, to make sense, to make personal meaning. And then I think Hong Kong is a very, uh, in a very good position because it's a cultural meeting point where we can pull the stories from different cultures together. Uh, and I would say we, can, we are in a very good position to enable comparative knowledge. And I think comparative knowledge is very important for the future of Hong Kong and also for the world because we are traveling a lot. We are getting a lot of information in the internet. We are knowing a lot of different things. But how to make sense of all these dif different things to make new knowledge? I think that's something we all need to work harder on. And in the past, most museum, our museum, is more object-based than people-based. Uh, in future, I would say we want to tell more humanistic stories. Why we want to get in touch with people? Because with all the technology, we are more and more you know, tied up in our own tiny world and only connect with the world with, through the internet uh, virtually. But then I would say there will be uh, an urge for people to connect with real people, real stories. So I think identifying humanistic sameness amongst people through the stories of artists, collectors, or curators, etc., would truly connect art with daily life and common people. And at the end of the day, I would say, but people are very worried that are you focusing on local so you are not um, an international museum, you are just talking about Hong Kong art, what about the uh, other arts? I would say I would want to remind people that we are Hong Kong Museum of Art. We are not Museum of Hong Kong Art. So we are still telling a global story, but in the very typical and very unique language uh, of Hong Kong is a mixture of local and global, personal and contemporary, a very diverse art experience that you would uh, enjoy in our museum. And, and I would say that's a very Hong Kong experience. So now I would propose for the future of Hong Kong and perhaps um, for the other counterparts as well, this concept of a glo uh, global museum. We always say that global, which is global and local coming together, but it's always global first and then local. And I would say the reverse is also true. Local first and then global, starting from the local to contribute our unique resources and perspectives to enrich the global. And that's what I think each city would be contributing their very different and unique things to enrich this global culture. So the museum have closed already since August and transformation is in progress. The museum is in the making. But uh, during these three years, I have to um, make a very uh, solemn 
announcement that we are, the building is closed, but the museum is not. We are still working. We are not taking a three-year holiday. Uh, so we are doing experiments of all these concepts that I've presented uh, in this coming three years. But of course, I think because it's something new, even when we reopen, I would say the experiments will go on and also with um, people uh, and people in the art community as well will we'll experiment together. So we need a lot of um, more hard thinking and hard working. This is an artwork by a local artist. And uh, I think it somehow visualized my vision of the future. Uh, of Hong Kong MA and also Hong Kong, is that uh, a very reclusive boat, which reminds us of a traditional literary landscape painting, is appearing in the middle of the metropolitan city on the waters of Victoria Harbor. That is Hong Kong. Hong Kong MA will be back in 2019. Finger cross. Thank you. So that's it. Thank you. That's it for my presentation. I will now hand over the stage to Dr. Lee. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, K11 Foundation and University of Leicester for having me here. Uh, I was told I'm going to have like a major audience student of the Hong Kong University, but I can see a lot of the mid-aged Asians and Westerner students. Uh, good morning, students. Uh, anyway, uh, working uh, in a museum and doing researches on audience. Whenever I ask the audience what they get out of a museum audience as a value or merit, I always hear almost the same thing. One is story about the object they view and the importance of cultural institutions like museum. So this tells me something that the audience come to the museum for story and to learn uh, so-called the social role of a museum. And, but uh, museums persistently uh, organizing exhibition because we think exhibition itself is our primary product. So it's uh, in a way against the uh, audience will. Uh, are we doing all right? The museum is doing all right? Or do we need to create another on-demand museum as we see uh, today's museum audience, they are not just a consumer. We are simultaneously uh, both consumer and producer by the very act of consuming in the market. I'm going to talk uh, today's my presentation by asking you some uh, conventional or broad questions on the museum. Why so many museums uh, around us? As you can see, uh, according to a statistics conducted by World Museum Community, there are 55,000 museums around the world. And 17,500 USA. And in China, I'm talking, because I'm from uh, Shanghai, I'm talking about the Chinese situation, 3,800 in China. And uh, as you can see, there is a huge museum boom in China. In 2011 alone, 386 museums were built in China, new museums. And the question is how to keep the visitors coming continuously, and also uh, how to manage sort of a curatorial direction. But most of the Chinese museums are experiencing sort of without clear curatorial missions and long-term plans and cohesive collections. And some of the museums sit very empty. So uh, there are also 160 museums in Beijing and uh, 150 in, in Shanghai. So the question is, can museums be of some help in our life? We need to persistently ask the museums in terms of uh, uh, representing the nature of the museum itself and for the paradigm shift in the future. What do they offer, by the way? And who is real 
consumer audience of museum. What are important notable gaps between museum goers and museum programmers? Is museum still the liveliest cultural uh, platform that keeps institutional conditions of life, of art alive? Do they grow together with audience and their supporters? Is museum still a wonder room or a cabinet of curiosity, as often called in the past? Is it still a temple of artifacts? Is it just a white cube as a neutral container for art objects, or it's already transformed into a historical construct and aesthetic objects, as Brian O'Doherty uh, defined? I'm going to ask you another side of the questions about the museum. Is museum research facilities? Is it amusement parks? Is it educational institutions, participatory platform, story vault? My question is going to be more radical as well as a simple. Is museum agent for social change? Is museum forums for dialogue? Museum is not just a witness to the history. It's a voice and a force in shaping the social future. Museum could be a social media. And also, museum can be a wider platform for social practice. I'm going to show you <clears throat> a work of the, uh, uh, the Swiss artist Thomas Hirschhorn. Hoshion uh, created a public space within a public space, the Ballet de Tokyo in Paris. Why an artist has decided to make like a, another public space inside the public space? He seems to have transformed the formal White Cube Museum into unexpectedly casual daily life space by creating kiosk, as you see, murals, flea markets, and Chinese way of uh, da daiji bao, which is a board. And also uh, the mo uh, monuments. He piled inside the space of the Palais de Tokyo with uh, uh, tires, banners, and other discarded objects from daily life. These monuments were created for homage to great thinkers such as Spinoza and George Bataille, Antonio Gramsci, and Gilles Deleuze. And he says, what I want to do is uh, create within an institution a place public space or moments of public space, a space for encounters, a space for dialogue, engagement, a space in which to be, to stay, to spend time, and a space in which to think. The question arises, why today's artists try to attack, deconstruct, and reinterpret the white cube space, which is a symbol of museum, and the commercial galleries in extension. Why do they try to transform the white cube into human environments? Is white cube so sinful? Who did define white cube or critical site? However, a future museum lies in successfully facilitating the interconnectedness of audience within institutions in being more in time with communities. This is a, a Thomas Horsch one. I'm not good at this technology. You're looking at uh, the eternal flame. The title of the work is Eternal Flamme Eternal. Hoshian considers 
eternal flame as his own temporary studio, authentic public institution, like a welcome center for writers, poets, philosophers, human science researchers who are left free to consider their intervention or their mere presence outside of any obligation towards the institution to engage in cultural moderation. He says, Eternal Flame is not an interactive exhibition. It is an active work a work whose activity never ceases. This activity is the act of thinking. This is where the work's title comes from. The eternal flame of thought, the eternal flame of art and philosophy, the eternal flame of poetry of what escapes us. Tate Modern, as you see, to me always looks like a kind of industrial cathedral. Tate Modern offered Abram Cruzviegas a mega installation at the Turbine Hall. Following on the previous Turbine Hall installations, like Olaf Eliasson's The Weather Project, in which the sun appeared to set indoors in 2003, and Ai Weiwei's Sunflower Seed, which covered the floor with the 10 million porcelain seeds in 2010. Mexican conceptual artist Abraham Chris Villegas employed many like a diamond shape of the wooden boxes. The title of the work is Empty Lot. Its inspiration from Mexico City's unplanned urban sprawl in which rural incomers build their own homes on whatever land they, get, they grasp with whatever materials they can lay their hands in. Cruz Vegas is an artist who has a brilliant approach to material, who is asking very current question about our relationship with materials, questions around ecology, economy, and so on. Tiers of the flint are laid out with the triangular mini gardens, each about eight feet long, which form striking diamond patterns over the surface. Each, each of these box is filled with uh, the earth from uh, different parks or gardens in London, from Buckingham Palace to uh, Hackney Marshes, which is watered and lit by lamps. Nothing has actually been planted inside. Oops. but seedings, seedlings already in the earth are expected to grow. Some areas are already sprouting weeds, other remains quiet and stony, quiet and stony. By April, when the project comes to end, we could see veritable forests rising uh, towards the roof. Empty lot is a dynamic and exciting in the turbine horn Hyundai Moto commissions. It feels suspended like a geometric island, perfectly poised in the immense space. There is also some ambivalence about the commissions within the art community, alluding to its detractors. Has art become spectacle? Could it suffer from gigantism? Nonetheless, it has converted generations of uninitiated visitors to the viewing and appreciation of contemporary art today. Tate Modern's Turbine Hall, for instance, Museum of Modern, MoMA's atrium space, and Paris Grand Ballet are examples of 
the way institutions have finally adopted large-scale sculptors and installations, which were mainly the remit of art biennales before. The question is, is biennale the alternative solution to the post y cube? Space arrangement of the museums sometimes overdetermines. This is work of the uh, Daniel Beren, French artist, inside the uh, Grand Palais in Paris. Sometimes it overdetermines and consumes artworks too much. They kill the context of the message of the artworks. This is works of uh, uh, Wolfgang Leib uh, at the Museum of Modern Atrium Space. The images I'm talking about not directly relate to the subject. They kill sometimes the context of the message of the artworks and make them a kind of voice list of objects. After all, most galleries, museums, and alternative spaces still employ the white cube as the favored model and space for exhibition making as the dominant model for the showing of art. And their ideology remains. Ideology remains one of the commodity fetishism, sometimes vague eternal capital value. Maybe I'm too much critical on this uh, definition of this space. The question is, does the museum need to introduce a program like the Tate Turbine Hall in order to present a program that pleases the crowd? Is satisfying the audience interest and hobbies the museum's guideline in the future? Is it the vocation of the museum to install the sense that contemporary art is fun to museum goers and unfamiliar with the contemporary art? Regarding the white cube, I'd like to read for what Brian Odoherty stated. Enter your white cube, a holy place with artificial lightings resembled ancient tomb, undisturbed by time and containing infinite riches and historical chaos. It gives artwork a timeless quality in both economic and political sense. Market can live forever in this guaranteed white cube without <clears throat> political upheavals. It is a space for immortality of a certain class, as well as a staging ground for objects for sound economic investment. Thus, White Cube is a place producing surplus value, not using value. He says surplus value is worse than using value. White Cube established a crucial dichotomy between that which is to be kept outside, the social and political, and that which is inside, the staying value of art. This is Anish Kapoor's uh, uh, the uh, revival at the Grand Palace space, as you see. I'm going to briefly talk about a Shanghai project that I'm preparing for next year. This is a very much a hybridized, like a cultural department store. Uh, we are taking like a buying a Biennale form, every two years format, but it's not really a Biennale because Biennale is supposed to dedicate contemporary art practice, but Shanghai project is going to be like a hybridized genre of art into a kind of a melting pot. And we're going to include uh, art, architecture, design, cinema, dance, performance, music, academic lecture series, and publication as a result of the event. And uh, as you know, department store is kind of epitome of the distribution industry today. So when you go to the department store, you stay longer than the museum. And then they buy everything what they need for their daily lives. This gives me, it alludes me like a, what would be the sort of a future museum, a future 
Biennale even, future artistic project. It's going to be like a one-day uh, culture tour. When they go to the department store, they stay minimum two, three hours, and then they eat, and they go to the cinema. Sometimes they can massage in, inside the department store. And then the convergence of the artifacts or convergence of the genre of art, the convergence of the ideas and ideologies can be put in together in the same place, which is called like a cultural department store. It's not real cultural department store, but it's a place where they can see many different genre of art so that the ordinary people can be interested in artistic event. As you know, the civic society in China has not been well developed so far. So we would like to give them an experience to ex experience a kind of culture in broader context and then artistic practice. So there is no any central stage of the uh, Shanghai project. It will be like a really scattered around many different uh, districts in Shanghai, including the river of the Huangpujiang and also museums. The uh, seven, eight museums in Shanghai are going to join us as one of the collateral events. So we're going to make like a general festival of arts genre uh, in the name of like a cultural uh, department store. So as you know, the Shanghai, the nice scene, the, the important thing is the population of Shanghai is 24 million. Uh, it's a consensus done in 2013. So uh, all of the Shanghainese, they say uh, the total population of Shanghai is like uh, probably 30 million. So as you know, the largest city in the world is Chongqing, 35 million. And Shanghai, probably the second. And the third might be Beijing and Guangzhou. So this kind of uh, mega cities, they don't have a real like a, a cultural artistic event where the people can experience, consume the work of art. So uh, it is very important in a way uh, to have them generally experience about the culture and art in the place it's called like a culture department store. We're we are going to invite like a, between 150 to 200 uh, researchers. We don't name them artist, architect, designer, whatever. We invite them under the name researchers, scholars uh, or activists or like uh, uh, the factory workers or citizens. And then the event venue place will be in the park with a tent because tent is a, like a symbol of nomadism. Tent is very important for the daily life of the Chinese because tent uh, stands for a kind of festival or festivalism traditionally. And uh, cultural nomadism means, uh, you know, the, the 30 million, the audience, the, the populations, they have their own limited number of the museums and libraries, but we're going to make many different venues, even on the street and the near the Huangpu River area, and also uh, some alternative spaces. And there are many uh, industrial factories left over. And then we're about to use those facilities as a cultural factory. The, this is, uh, as you see, London Fridge uh, Master inside a tent. So uh, we're not going to use like a same size or material of the tent, but we're going to invite like four architects to have them design the tent in, in the, uh, the Suzy Park, which is a very, very big uh, century park in Pudong area. So the, one of the important thing is uh, those are new citizens of Shanghai who are migrants from other citizens in, in China. So like a more than 15 million people, they are new migrants from the other cities. So I'm very interested in those like a new citizens of Shanghai who formed the new Shanghai. So we're going to like have a, a lot of the talk with them, with the scholars who have been researching on this like uh, radical urbanization of the Shanghai. So Shanghai, as you know, many of, like the other many uh, ports, uh, they have lots of the optimism and also commercialization made of uh, attitude and also they are utopians. 
and uh, port, they embrace a lot of like, uh, uh, heterogeneous cultures easily. So the venue will be like uh, September 4 to November 13, 70 days. Uh, what I'm going to say, I'm not just introducing you the nature of the Shanghai project as an artistic, global artistic event where hybridized like uh, culture and art is going to be experienced by the audience. I'm just telling you the nature of the, of the museum itself is going to be very much importantly uh, need to house all different of the genre of art, of course, and even like as a social media should be functioning as a social media. And also it's a place where people can act uh, with their own uh, ideas and ideologies. It's a place for the debate and discussion as well. So uh, generally speaking, uh, I'm talking about sort of a general uh, paradigm shift of the museum. So what is the, the museum today? And what are we expecting? What have we been expecting about the function of the museum? And then uh, there's no any right answer. As uh, the, the Eva said, the future is a bit, in, is not sort of uh, visible. But uh, we can discuss about it uh, in our uh, the, the debate time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee, Ms. Tam. May I pass the mic back to our chair today, Dr. Adrian Chan? And can I have um, Dr. Lee to come on stage again, and also Ms. Tam to come on stage? And we can have a very short discussion. And if everyone has uh, questions to our speakers, please feel free to ask. Well, thank you for uh, such a wonderful presentation. I'm sure you guys um, have learned a lot. Um, so this is the, going to be the casual chit-chat um, session where we're going to have a very simple Q&A and then I'm going to pass it to the audience uh, for you guys to ask questions. Um, very quickly, I think um, after hearing two presentations, I realized that there are some similarities in talking about the idea, the role of museums, of the future museums as um, with a social voice, as a social mission, as a social identity, whether it's low ball, uh, right, Eve, low ball kind of uh, 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 social identity, or whether it's a, it's really, you know, making art more and culture cross pollinating and uh, more accessible. Uh, I want to ask Eve in one a, a very quick question. How does you know? We're talking about the Y cube, about space, about visitors' experience, about the new uh, Hong Kong Museum of Art. Um, aside from how the space. Uh, reinterpretation of the space. How does the digital experience with the space all integrate together into the visitors' experience? And how does how do you create this social uh, social voice through all these tools? This is um, a very good question, and we are still exploring because um, I think the digital world is changing very quickly and uh, how to engage people meaningfully through the different uh, social media channels available. I think that that's something we have to learn from some very advanced museums like the Tate Modern and other um, global museums. Uh, but then we are doing some experiments, little experiments during this closure. Uh, we are doing some interactive games, animations, and also we are collaborating with um, organizations who are very experienced in exploring this type of high technologies into the interpretation of our collection and also uh, in enhancing our interaction with especially the young generation. But then uh, there's no concrete plan yet because um, it's Everything is in the flux, I, I would say, even um, the development of social media itself. And uh, I would say in terms of promotion, uh, it's a very good way of reaching out to people because I believe in our last visitor survey, uh, uh, one data finding that we got is that uh, nowadays people come to the museum and know about our exhibitions not through uh, newspapers or advertising, advertisements that we do um, uh, in uh, MTR or, or, or elsewhere in the city, but by uh, words of mouth, which means, I would say, the sharing on Facebook and other social media platforms. 
Um, so I think that's something that we need to um, explore, especially a marketing team, uh, about how to engage and uh, publicize um, uh, the museum programs. But in terms of how to make use of these very quick changing platforms to engage audience meaningfully, uh, that I would say we need a lot more thinking. Yeah. And Dr. Lee, for um, a, qu a quick question regarding your cultural emporium, um, basically imagining a museum as a department store where you can actually consume art. You can pick art from the shelf and eat it, throw it, or consume it immediately. Uh, make it very accessible, uh, cultural nomadism. Um, so I just want to ask you a quick question. Now you're the director of Himalayas Museum in Shanghai. How are you transforming Himalayas into this cultural emporium? And how does that relate to the program that you mentioned in Shanghai next year? Uh, what will be the role of Himalayas? I briefly introduced about my uh, next year's uh, artistic proje project, but I wonder if it's going to be the right name, like a cultural department store. Department store is a place where you can buy ready-made products, but we're not selling that kind of things. Art and culture is all about the process. The process making and then having the audience to participate in our project itself is very important. So uh, conveniently, I try to define the nature of the next year's uh, Shanghai project as a cultural department store where they can shop everything at the same time, where they can spend more time. I have never heard a story that people spend like a day like as a cultural tour. So would like to make the citizens of Shanghai and global citizens to be part of this project as a cultural one-day cultural tourist. That's what I wanted to define. And uh, as I said, there is no any uh, central stage of the Shanghai project. We're going to use like uh, six different venues, including uh, the largest park in, in located in the Pudong area. And also, Shanghai Himalaya Museum is going to be playing as a, a sort of center for the administration, organizing all this. And then, uh, as I said, Pudong is the largest district in Shanghai. Shanghai has a 16 different districts. But there are uh, some uh, districts in the northern part, like uh, Hong Kong and Baoshan. That area has never been benefited culturally. So we're going to extend this artistic venue to that particular part of the northern city of Shanghai so that they can at least experience and participate about this event. And uh, so uh, the having a non-central place is very important. Because if, uh, you know, we really don't like to have like, this is central stage, and this is a central city, it's just a central project, something like that. We're going to, in a way, uh, spread it out, deconstruct this uh, central uh, structure of the artistic organizations so that people can uh, freely participate. The question is, uh, there are many of the Shanghai citizens, as I briefly mentioned about new migrants from uh, other districts, other cities in, Ch in China, they have no direct cultural experience. They don't really understand about the context of culture, let's say, in general. So uh, education is a very important part of the project. And uh, that's why rather than using a already built, already existing museum or alternative space, we try to make a tent inside the, uh, the park. Tent, as you see, uh, it's like an you know, umbrella when you are walking under the rainy day. And an umbrella gives you a sense of emotion. And then you find yourself, like a, including your ego, everything. So uh, Chinese people, they really enjoy the tent. And then we're going to put many different genres of uh, arts and culture inside the tent. Like say, as you know, uh, the first room could be like a Marina of Rome, which is a, a performance. And then next room could be a Fassbinder's uh, experiment film. The cinema, I'm not talking about the blockbuster cinema. It's going to be experimental indie film as well as uh, the art film produced by the artists themselves. And then there could be like uh, Alessandro Mendini's uh, design studio. Or we're going to invite like uh, Hojuk de Merong's uh, architecture, uh, the uh, tentative studio. So uh, people can experience art and culture in general. So I thought this is uh, kind of needed for the citizens in Shanghai. I think another great uh, idea is that you're breaking away from, from the confinement of the Himalayas Museum, but really extending out 
So Shanghai becomes the museum itself, and you really bring that spirit of, of, of a great museum to uh, the audience of Shanghai. That's wonderful. Um, I would like to pass the, my mic to uh, the audience, and if anyone have any questions, feel free to uh, ask our speakers. I have a question. Thank you very much. I enjoyed very much the comments about the tent. Um, and I wanted to ask if you felt like that the festival um, or the temporary installation was more appropriate um, as the future of the museum for a city like Shanghai. As we all know, the production of art and culture itself is very subtle. We need uh, a lot of the discussion with the civic society, but we are a bit suffering uh, from those of uh, the lack of the civic society in China, but they're growing, obviously. And then making tent itself is a bridge to the citizens of Shanghai, which is a very familiar culture to them, traditionally, historically. So uh, it's not just a tent made of fabrics. It's a design tent by the architects. We are inviting four architects to make their own sort of uh, uh, typical or aesthetic tents with the different colors. And then that is will be located in the center uh, a central place, which is Luzazui Park. Luzazui is a very central put, new Pudong area with the high rises and skyscrapers. And then the next stage is that, as I briefly said, we're going to invite like a lot of the the art cultural practitioners uh, who are supposed to work with the citizens. We're also inviting like an equivalent number of the citizens to be part of this project, including uh, scholars, working class of you know factory workers and then uh, taxi drives, whoever they are. So almost 200 different category of the citizens. We're going to officially title them as viewer participants to this project. So it's very, very uh, practically and theoretically and subtly organized. Uh, thank you very much. I got two very simple questions for uh, Eve and uh, Dr. Lee. And the first one, I want to ask Eve, uh, you show me a very interesting diagrams in your presentation. There's a three circles, which is present, future, and past. And then for me, it's most interesting thing is a triangle, you know, intersection in the middle. Do you have any thought about what do you mean about the intersection middle, you know, the triangle things? I would say the intersection, the overlapping triangle, it could mean different things for different people. That's why in future, I don't think in the past, uh, we usually curate in-house exhibitions or bring in exhibitions from other parts of the world without really coming together to think about um, the collection and also how the exhibits could talk to each other. And I think with different dialogues, with different collaborations with museums or maybe independent curators, we can have a different proposals of this um, overlapping narratives that we can come up with to interpret our past, present, and future in a different way. I don't think there is a uh, authoritative uh, narrative about what it is or it should be, but it's something in, also in the making. And that's something we all need to work together to explore the diversity. But I am sure uh, whenever we uh, are, uh, relate with different cultures or with different places or with different times, the triangle would be different. So that's a simple answer. Right, thank you very much. I think you probably want to, if I can understand it, it's like a kind of break down the linear structure of yes. past, present, and the future. And I think is the time is, usually we think of time as well, we do exhibitions usually like in a chronological order, the historical development of this and that, and then to this is somehow very, uh, very much Darwin's uh, idea of uh, evolution. But I think, in fact, things are existing in parallel. It does not go away, the past does not go away, and we are redefining the past in every moment. And the past itself is uh, when we are looking at the past, is an archaeology of the future. So that's what I want to put forward. It's not this very linear thinking. You said uh, currently we have a booming, booming period for the Chinese museums. It's every year you've got hundreds of museums established in China. However, all these museums are possibly run or already run without a very clear role of the curatorship. It's like they're running the museum without a clear curatorship commission in there. So um, uh, 
Do you think in the future, the Chinese Museum will have a specific role as a career in the museums like a curators? Or will keep like a running the museum without a professional curators in the museums? That's one of the really topics all of the, always uh, when we have uh, panels on museum organization, museum management in China. Uh, well, there's like a bit of exaggerations on the, uh, the Chinese museum boom. They say there are like uh, 100 museums are coming out, coming into being every year. But you see, uh, in terms of the contemporary art museum, there are only uh, 14 notable, remarkable contemporary museums existing in Shanghai. So you see, uh, if the 100 museums are coming out, Shanghai may have like uh, two, 300 museums. It, it's not really true. Anyway, uh, private sectors, including big corporations and companies and big collectors, they started to realize their own museums. But uh, I believe they have uh, infrastructures, but they don't have software, mm -hmm. which means uh, sort of, as you say, the curatorial practice, yeah. and then how to manage their own collections, how to run the museum into right direction. So uh, many museums, of course, they have a very beautiful uh, building, which is a very nice a suit of the body, but they don't have a real cura professional uh, curators. But some of the museums, uh, including public museum, let's say. In Shanghai, there's a power station what, that has been converted from the uh, power, state, power plant to, uh, to museum. And also there's a Zhonghua Yi Gong, which is an art palace. And then these two museums focused on modern and contemporary art. They are doing very all right. And then they have uh, lots of curators. They are professional curators who have been programming since the birth of these two institutions. And then some private museums they have also a curatorial team. But some of the other museums uh, run by sort of owner's will, let's say, which is uh, uh, understandable. But it takes time. You can't really solve it in the two, three years of time. So uh, museum will come out more and more, of course. As you see, the total number of the museums in the United States is 17,000. China, we have like 3,800 today. But some, you know, in a certain period of time, we may be able to exceed that 17,000 number, but number doesn't really matter. The quality and the professionalism as well. So what I can say is it really takes time. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, do we have a last question? Yeah, going to time, we, this will be the last question. Okay, thank you. This is a question for Dr. Lee. Um, more and more institutions, I think, are wanting artists to come and work with their, the audience and with the citizens, as you, as you say. And I wonder th what the, the demands that this places on the artist and how art education is actually in a position to be able to respond to that demand. Because it's... Um, it's a very particular set of skills, I think, you need to work with people who may have perhaps limited experience of art and culture. Are you aware of any educational programs that are helping to prepare artists of, of, of all kinds in order to meet that, that demand? Well, thank you very much. That's a, it's it's a such an important question. Uh, the future museum, uh, audience participation, and engagement with the uh, audience or practitioners is going to be unavoidable. And uh, <clears throat> more and more, as I said, the today's museum audience, they are not just one of the consumers. They are very much opinionated, more and more. And then they start to demand the, the context and programming. They want to be part of that as well. So uh, what would be the really future of the museum? Without this, museum is not just, uh, you know, it will be like a physical space. So in terms of uh, hosting those, uh, the, uh, the viewers' participation into the museum context is going to be really crucial element of the museum for the future. And also that, for instance, uh, the, since my arrival to uh, Shanghai Himalas Museum, I started to construct an educational committee 
it's uh, functioning much more important than like a board of trustees. Education committees consist of uh, uh, the, uh, the educationers and some uh, young students as well. And uh, even like a general public, they can be like a merchant selling the, the daily uh, the commodities in the market. And then also we are inviting uh, the, uh, the, the cultural activists as well. So without these uh, uh, crucial involvement from the civic society, let's say in general, the museum store is going to be limited. So I'm very much focusing on this. Well, thank you very much today for this wonderful keynote uh, presentation. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Eve, um, Eve Tam. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. Thank you.